Good evening to those bored enough to watch. In 2022, Sonic Frontiers was released to the world, in which I was one of the many people who were quite excited to see it. To me, it had a very interesting concept, and anything involving this blue hedgehog in a new installment in the franchise is bound to capture my interest. I got this game as a gift during my birthday around a month after the game had launched, and, well, it's safe to say that I would be rather occupied on my free time during the Christmas holidays that year. I played Sonic Frontiers when it released and have loved it ever since then. I've gone on to play the game a few more times after that, my most recent memory of having done so being in September. September of 2023, when the Final Horizons update launched. I decided to go back and play through the game again before moving on to the new content. For a long time now, I've been wanting to make this video to talk about why I loved it. I'll only be talking about the base experience in this game, and I will be saving the third update for another video. I hope that doesn't disappoint, and so with that, I want to talk about why this game stuck out in my memory so much and why it's gone on to become one of my favourite Sonic games in recent times. So, with that said, let's discuss Sonic Frontiers. The game opens with Eggman approaching a mural of some sort and implanting a device of some kind on it. He's trying to find the secret of the ancients. Suddenly, enemies of some kind arise from the ground, in which the device Eggman of whatever was in the mural, and in attempts to stop it, Eggman is sent in with it. We cut to Sonic, Tails, and Amy, who've arrived to the Starfall Islands in hopes of finding out what drew the Chaos Emeralds to these islands, though they're later intercepted by some kind of force which opens a portal and drags them inside. Later, after making it out, Sonic is found to be the only one who escaped, in which a mysterious voice calls upon him, deeming him the key as he was able to escape the location by the name of Cyberspace, with his own power, and tells him to find the Chaos Emeralds to destroy some titans. After a brief tutorial which shows the player things such as attacking, puzzles, and an overall introduction to the game's open world, we're now given the freedom to explore the Kronos Island. The game follows Sonic as he journeys through five islands in search of the Chaos Emeralds which are scattered throughout. During his journey, he'll be searching for his friends on the island, of whom are stuck between cyberspace and reality, and he'll be spending time with them as well as the Coco, creatures of whom require some kind of help from them. I think that this is a really well-executed gameplay loop for the most part, as each island has plenty to explore and do within as well as having their own unique section of the story to tell, making them all stand out from one another as each character has their own goals and ambitions they discover during the plot. In Kronos Island, Sonic will find Amy in the Chaos Emeralds, and alongside her they help a Coco who's been trying to find their long lost love, as if they don't confess their feelings now, they may never get the chance to again. One thing I really liked about this first island is Sonic's character, as while he wants to help, he prioritises trying to find a way to aid his friends more, even arguing to Amy that the duo should let the Coco finish things on their own, expressing his worries that while he wouldn't abandon someone in need, he's also worried about his friends and trying to find a way to free them. Another thing I really liked about these islands are the traversal and how running around in them felt surreal and was genuinely a fun experience. Even if I wasn't exploring the island, I'd just be aimlessly running around because the movement felt so great to control. I really enjoyed it, as taking in the world around me was a beautiful experience, especially on these first few islands. With that though, we were just Sonic and Amy eventually discover what became of the Coco they were trying to help, as they found themselves finally embracing in the midst of the explosions that killed them all. Their love transcended time, something of which resonated with Amy as she shares her newfound desire to, when this ordeal is over, share that love with the world. She's worried that it'll take herself and Sonic apart for however long she's gone, but he assures and encourages her to embark on her venture, simply wanting to hear all about it when she gets back. Meanwhile, Eggman and Sage, a new character introduced earlier in the story as she's been using the aforementioned Titans to attack Sonic with the limited control she has over them, to try and find some way out of the cyberspace she's been trapped in. Unlike Sonic and Sage, Eggman can't enter and leave whenever he pleases, and Sage struggles with trying to find a safe way to get him out of there. Eventually, Sonic finds all six of the Chaos Emeralds on the island and begins making his way to the Titan, as the seventh rests on its head. So, before we begin to fight it, we need to make our way up there in order to retrieve it. After doing so, the first Super Sonic boss fight begins. During these fights, you'll go up against a titan that'll last however many rings you have at that moment, so do be sure to keep it at maximum before the fight begins. I really enjoyed these fights, even after beating the game a few times I always find myself coming back to play through them, as the OST and the general atmosphere of the fight is so surreal and amazing to the point where something within it keeps me coming back. Especially when you come back after unlocking more of the skill tree within the game, these fights are all the more entertaining as there is a greater arsenal of moves to use within them. I suppose I should take this moment to talk more about the combat in general, which is also something I found to be very entertaining. During the open world, you run into many bosses that you have the option to fight in order to obtain the necessary items for progressing through the game's story, in which I found them all unique and entertaining as the combat is very well executed with an emphasis on it being easy to learn but hard to master. As while the arsenal of moves you can use is rather small compared to most action games, how you interconnect them with one another is essential to mastering it as it maximizes how much damage you can do. Overall, I had a lot of fun with this combat system, as it's elevated more as you progress through the skill tree within this game and also during repeat 
playthroughs. With that, after defeating the first Titan, Giganto, Sonic returns to Amy to see that she's still stuck between realities. So, Sonic travels to the next island of the game to find its respective Titan and take it down. Eri's island is a desert island which is where Sonic finds Knuckles, of whom states that he was here investigating some ruins on Angel Island before being transported here, stuck between cyberspace and reality. So, Sonic now embarks on finding the Emerald as a new Titan is on the horizon on this island. This is where I want to talk about another aspect of this game, that being the cyberspace levels within. On the numerous islands you traverse through, you'll find portals that you can open with gears after beating the many mini-bosses on the island, which enters you into a cyberspace stage. They're normally small and don't take that long to complete, however, I found them to be extremely replayable. The game incentivizes things like getting the S rank on them, finding the red star rings or completing the stage with a certain number of rings in general in order to get more vault keys per stage. Vault keys are necessary for finding a lot of the emeralds as a lot of them are locked behind them, and if you don't want to be waddling around the island trying to find new cyberspace stages to play, it's probably within your best interest to try and complete all of the objectives on one of them. Regardless of the requirement, I still found playing through them extremely fun and engaging as even when I didn't need the vault keys at that moment, I'd still enter into them to play through them, normally keeping me busy for a good while as I'd be busy with things like finding the red star rings or perfecting the stage for an S rank. It was a great experience, and I like how the game gives incentive to do these, as it just encourages doing so more. With that though, Knuckles finds a wartime Coco of whom is supposed to be meeting up with their unit, but can't due to being pinned down by an enemy. Throughout their time on the island, Sonic and Knuckles will be trying to aid them by reuniting them with their unit, as well as taking down the enemy they think is pinning them down. This eventually leads to the Coco finding peace and moving on, which gives Knuckles a sentimental feeling. Anyone who's played Sonic Adventure would know that he is the last of his kind, left with the responsibility of guarding the Master Emerald for the rest of his life. He envies Sonic, who has the freedom to do as he pleases, go where he pleases, and generally lives with little responsibility. In other words, he goes where the wind takes him, and over time Knuckles has wanted a slice of that lifestyle. With the newfound clarity given to him by the Coco's passing and Sonic's encouraging words, he has a goal for when this ordeal is over, to leave the Angel Island and live a little. I really liked Knuckles' plight in this game. It feels somewhat relatable. Feeling pinned down by the responsibilities in your life makes one feel unable to live their lives in the ways that others do, evoking a sense of envy for those who get to spend their lives doing as they please, going where the wind takes them. Especially as you grow older, that feeling becomes more prominent in your life, and it is a cycle that can be hard to get out of. Sonic and the Coco are the ones that break Knuckles out of this feeling, and I feel as though it's a somewhat new angle for his character as in every Sonic game where Knuckles has a prominent role within, he's always there coincidentally for the Master Emerald and not much else. I really liked Sonic's character in these scenes as well, ones where he knows to take the situation seriously and not crack jokes like he commonly does. It really does feel as though he cares for the feelings of those around him and understands their plight, making the decision to listen to them talk and give them advice rather than make jokes and sarcastic remarks like we see him do so much throughout this game. Both characters here are presented amazingly, and that is something I can appreciate about this game. With that aside, after finding six of the Chaos Emeralds scattered on the island, Sonic approaches the Titan and confronts it to get to the seven. One thing I want to talk about with these Titan fights is that they're all unique and distinct from one another, which in my opinion makes them all differentiate and stand out as each of them have their own memorable moments that I enjoyed in each one. This one in particular sees Super Sonic and Wyvern flying around the island dodging missiles and attacks while giving out some of his own. I really enjoyed this fight in the base game, as it really was action packed and adrenaline pumping, as something about flying around at top speed on the island we had just spent countless hours roaming around on foot is invigorating and highlights a sense of progression in the game. With that, after imploding Wyvern, Sonic briefly addresses Knuckles, mentioning that he needs to find the last Titan located on the next island, hoping to find Tails during that journey as he's been getting increasingly more worried about him. So, after encouragement from Knuckles, Sonic takes off to the next island in the game. Before discussing the next island, one detail in this game that I want to appreciate is Sonic and his increasingly worsened state from all the cyber energy he's been intaking. Throughout this point onward until the next island of the game, we'll see Sonic's worsening state reflected through his idle animations, at first holding his head to then being unable to stand among many other details. I really liked this, as up until now the cyber energy hadn't been talked about much aside from small comments from the other characters, so seeing it finally creep up and catch up to Sonic was really interesting to see, as it grasps the player's attention on wanting to see where the game will go with this. This island is probably one of the best in the game in my opinion. This is where everything I love about this game slowly begins to present itself. It's no secret that previous Sonic games didn't exactly do a good job at doing any of the characters justice, and I think that Sonic Frontiers takes the steps at rectifying that by giving them a sense of depth here while setting a foundation for future Sonic games. For starters, Knuckles and Amy actually play a role in the story, unlike in Sonic Forces where the game gives the illusion that they're meant to be integral parts of the story, but in reality, it's more akin to the Sonics, Tails, and the Avatar doing everything while they were there. However, that changes in this game, where the characters feel like they play a role in traversing through the islands, as normally they're the ones insisting on helping the Coco. It gives them characters 
characterization when they're actually influencing what happens in the story and not putting everything on hold just because Sonic isn't there like it did with Forces. Another nice detail with this game is that the Coco and the plights they face correlate to that of the characters. For example, Tails is faced with aiding a Coco who's an apprentice to a pilot who's trying to find the final parts to complete their project. They don't want to disappoint the one they look up to until Sonic and Tails help them with finding the parts. This directly correlates with Tails, as later in the story he'll begin to talk about how he feels as though he's not helping enough whenever a time of crisis arrives, directly referencing what happened in Sonic Forces. I think that this game takes the steps at rectifying his character by establishing this plot point, as it leads the path for new elements for his character in future games. It's definitely not the first time that Tails has gone through a journey of this kind, as he did this in Sonic Adventure as well, but I think that repeating this retread is a necessary step as Sonic Forces, in my own opinion, did irreparable damage to a lot of characters in the series. I also think that it's a good detail in this game to directly reference events from other games, as it establishes a sense of interconnectivity between them. It's here that I want to talk about a key element of this game's story, covering the theme of death and how its inevitability doesn't mean that life in itself is futile. Throughout this game, characters like Sage in the end question why Sonic helps the Coco when their fate is already decided, as doing so is futile when their time has already come to an end and their lives are over. Yet the Coco left so much of their history behind, such as cyberspace and the ancient ruins they built during their lifetime. Throughout the game, we'll see what happened to them and how the end ultimately killed them all despite their attempts at fighting and retreating. Sonic and his friends directly combat the notion that the end presents, that due to death's inevitability, life and everything it has to offer is futile because the end reaches everyone, which to it deems everything one did in their life is pointless. Yet throughout the game, the characters will combat that by helping the Coco find peace in their tragedies, and also find peace within themselves in what they want to do. They're given a sort of clarity by helping them, as mentioned by Tails, by helping the Coco reunite with their true love, Amy wants to venture out into the world and spread love to all, by helping the Coco reunite with their troops and find peace together, Knuckles is finally given the clarity to leave the island and live a life of his own while balancing responsibilities as the last echidna. Tails, by helping his apprentice find the final parts, is given the clarity to journey out into the world and find himself on his own without being so reliant on Sonic all the time. For me, when I first played this game and experienced this, I was touched, and it's a reason that I love this game so much. It takes Sonic and its characters to a new level while tackling the themes of death and what it means to live a life that can be remembered and cherished by all, whether it be yourself and those around you, as seen by the Coco who despite being constantly hunted down by the end, managed to preserve their history for generations beyond their own to find. This game genuinely touched me. Aside from the fun gameplay, the beautiful music and the new age of this franchise that it represents, it's one of the reasons that I can call this game one of my favourite Sonic games out there, regardless of the issues I'll soon talk about. With that though, Sonic soon finds all the Chaos Emeralds and advances to the 7th atop the head of Knight, the titan of this island. In this fight, we'll be flying around the respective arena, both on the shield and also using it to deflect onto them whenever they start shooting it at you, in which when they do so, you need to aim it at them while they move around the arena. In the base game, this is one of my favourite titan fights in the game. I like the other ones, but this one was genuinely so awe-inspiring and captivating, whether it be the brilliant OST or the atmosphere it presents. Ultimately though, it ends with Sonic grabbing the sword used by Knight in the fight and slicing them in half. After taking them down, Sonic sees a vision of one of the ancients before flying off to the next island of the game. The Six Towers of Rhea Island rise with the final titan being defeated, and as he's commanded to silence them by the end, Sonic in his injured state being barely able to stand from all the cyber corruption, gets up and assures Tails that he's fine. As you progress through the island and silence more towers, more about the ancients is past is revealed, as you learn about how the titans were initially designed to fight the end as they sought refuge on the Starfall Islands from it. Ultimately, it followed them which led to a showdown in space where one of the ancients binded their titan to the end and was killed in the process. The remaining three followed through with the intended plan behind the binding and sealed not only the end, but the titan it was interconnected with in cyberspace. As Sonic silences the towers, he'll become more and more cyber corrupted, and though he's being consumed by it, in the face of danger, he simply smiles and continues onward. This exceeds a point where Sonic can go no longer, and when he takes on so much cyber corruption, he becomes trapped between realities, nearly standing idly in place, determined to help everyone but himself. Amy, Knuckles, and Tails go back into cyberspace in hopes of bringing Sonic back, and when he returns, Sage implores Eggman, who's also back from cyberspace, to ally with Sonic and take down the end together. Eggman puts his feelings towards Sonic aside, and seeing how badly his daughter wants this, agrees to do so. And so, we find ourselves in the final island of the game. These two islands, in my opinion, are where the cracks in this game's foundation begin to show. For starters, I think that it's justifiable that many people don't even consider Rhea Island to be a full explorable map in the game since you don't even spend that much time in it. It really does feel like more was supposed to be here, but ultimately some things needed to be cut and the content in this island was among 
with them. Instead, we get this island fully dedicated to plot exposition, when it really does feel like the plot was gradually supposed to reveal itself more naturally and gradually as Sonic traversed the islands like it did with the different characters in Sonic Adventure. Rhea Island doesn't give much reason to return to it, as once you're done with it, you just move straight onto the final island of the game. This one is a fully explorable section of the game like it is with the first three, but I think that it's considerably worse than those ones. Keep in mind that I'm talking about just the base game here as opposed to the content added in the Final Horizons update, which I'll save for its own video for reasons I'll discuss later. In the base game, I find it to be very serviceable, it has everything that the previous islands had, but in my opinion, it feels more like it's trying to make the player grind as opposed to emphasizing a feeling of natural progression in the game like the previous islands did. For example, the final interaction with Sage makes the player grind for a surplus of heart tokens to access the finale. I could excuse things like making me grind pinball before the fight with Knight, hence why I never mentioned it during that respective section of the game because while I felt like the game was trying to waste my time, that feeling was nowhere near as prominent as it is now. It really does feel like the game didn't have enough time to create this natural progressive feeling of marching towards the big fight at the end of each island, but still needed to make it as long as the previous islands, and thus makes you grind for things like heart tokens and whatnot. I do want to talk about something that I like before discussing the finale of the game, and that's the relationship Eggman has with Sage. Throughout the game you'll find that Eggman treats her as though she's a surrogate daughter of some kind, if anything like an actual child of his since he was the one who created her. This is something expressed throughout the game as you'll see Eggman compliment Sage during his time in cyberspace while she kept him safe from all the dangers. Additionally, we'd also see how deeply Sage cares for Eggman as she shows how keeping him safe is her priority rather than trying to get him out of cyberspace as soon as possible. The game also shows how Sage gradually begins to understand the importance of meaningful relationships that Sonic has with the other characters and wishes for something like that with Eggman. Not understanding that such a caring relationship is what she already has with him but doesn't see it until the end where she learns to stop seeing herself as a robot created by him and more rather as a being he cares for with the help of Sonic. You can also see how deeply Eggman cares for Sage too through his interactions with her and how he speaks with her, oftentimes with a caring and compassionate tone yet keeps that feeling reserved to himself. This is ultimately fully shown before the finale, where Sage knows what she needs to do in order to help Sonic fight the end and so Eggman addresses his dear daughter as such before she leaves. Before fighting the end, Sonic gathers the Chaos Emeralds with the help of Eggman and fights Supreme, a fight that felt very nice to play through as it has a lot of elements from the previous Titan fights. Yet when it comes to an actual finale, it feels like this is supposed to be a build up to a climactic battle, and yet, Sonic Sonic's reaction to beating Supreme is the same as any of ours, simply asking if that was it. The end arrives and the battle is taken to outer space, where Sonic, teamed with Sage, goes through a top-down shooter boss fight to beat the end. During my playthroughs of this game, I really didn't mind this fight, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel slightly underwhelmed with it. On one hand, the music and the speech given by the end during the fight and what comes subsequently to it felt very climactic and emphasised a feeling of this truly being the end, but on the other hand, this is a game where we fought formidable foes, such as the first three titans where we've cut them in half, imploded them with their own bombs among many other spectacles, and this is what the game does for its climax, I can understand why one would feel underwhelmed by what this fight had to offer, even if the majority of me didn't feel that way and on repeat playthroughs can somewhat grow to appreciate it. However, in hindsight of what we have now, it does have an aura of disappointment to it in light of what the true vision for the finale was supposed to be with the third update coming out. With that, after defeating the end, it begins to implode, in which Sage sacrifices herself to prevent it from impacting the earth, with her final words being to look after after Eggman as Sonic is sent plummeting back down to the ground. While he reunites with his friends and celebrates his victory with them, Eggman somberly looks at the stars falling, hoping that somewhere among them, he'll see his daughter falling among them. Though, eventually he accepts her fate and simply looks at the sky, thus ending Sonic Frontiers. After beating the game, there is a lot that you can do. The most prominent is that of the Final Horizons update which you can find the portal to on the last island if you know where to look. Additionally, you can also engage with the arcade mode, which allows you to replay all of the respective cyberspace challenges individually in the game. This is something I engaged with quite often, especially when I found myself randomly wanting to replay the cyberspace stages in the game. There's also the Battle Rush mode, in which there's one for each island. In it, you'll face off against all the enemies seen on their respective islands before ultimately facing off against the Titans. I didn't play with a lot, but I found it to be enjoyable to test my skills on combat even outside of the supersonic fights. Additionally, there's also the cyberspace challenges in the game which, similarly to the battle rush, makes you play through the cyberspace stages in succession to one another. I found this too to be an enjoyable experience, but I didn't really engage with it as much. Aside from that, there wasn't really anything as side content that captured my interest, so with that, I want to conclude things. 
Sonic Frontiers, since its release and many updates, has genuinely become one of my favourite Sonic games, a feeling amplified by what the game has become over the course of the past year. It's not a perfect game, I think it has a lot of issues that I hope were made clear during this video. Yet, I hope I've showed why I think this game is a brilliant one, with so much to offer while setting the foundation of what future titles in this franchise have to offer. There is still the third update that I want to talk about when that time comes, but I've chosen to exclude it from this video because the content it adds is so much to the point where, in my opinion, it completely reconfigures contextualizes the final section of this game, and for that reason I want to make a separate video about it. With that aside though, Sonic Frontiers is genuinely an amazing game that really touched me when I first played it, and I hope that if you choose to play this game for yourself, it does the same for you too. So, there's the video, I hope you all enjoyed it. I've been wanting to make this video for so long, for basically majority of 2023 and I probably would have if I had the chance, but here we are and I hope the wait was worth it. If you want to view the list of games I want to make videos about in the future, then you can always do so through the link in the description. Additionally, if you want to follow me, then my socials will be linked in the description, as well as any afterthoughts or messages I may want to add. With that, I haven't really got much else I want to say, so I'll see you all in my next video. I hope you all enjoyed the video and I wish you all a very pleasant evening.